Janet Yellen recently, she said that the U.S. dollar will slowly lose its reserve currency status, and this BRICS movement is not really a threat. I think in this case, Ms. Yellen is probably more right than wrong, in the sense oh. that so many of the debts in the world are denominated by U.S. dollars, that demand for U.S. dollars stays strong. And until, you know, right now the BRICS is an idea. Let's say, as an example, that Nigeria ran a trade surplus with China, a big trade surplus with China uh, in oil, and the Nigerians decided that they wanted the Chinese gold. How do they get it? Right. I I think that despite our best efforts to wreck the dollar, it will be the reserve currency for the balance of my life. For the record, I'm 70. I think that we will continue to diminish our franchise. But you know, Mike, <clears throat> some years ago, you probably remember this. I was going around the world selling various Sprott products, but in particular, our exchange traded physical gold trusts to sovereign wealth funds around the world. And I won't mention the country, but it, let's just say it was an Asian country that we had a reasonable relationship with. And, and I looked and saw that in the sovereign wealth fund, the predominant asset, a liquid asset, was U.S. Treasuries. And I was curious about that. I said, you know, first of all, as an American, thank you. You know, I, I love this circumstance. We love being subsidized by you. And I pointed out at the time the discrepancy between the maintenance of the purchasing power uh, in U.S. Treasuries relative to the interest rate that they were being paid and pointed out, too, as gently as I could, the deteriorating financial position of the debtor, the U.S. government, the debt and deficits. And I said, you know, from my point of view, the U.S. Treasury feels sort of like a lie. And my counterpart looked at me and smiled and said, ah, yes, Mr. Rule, but a deep and liquid lie, uh, unlike the lies other people tell us. And then I said, so you trust us? And he said, no, of course not. But we trust you more than we trust each other. And I think that's important. When you and I look at the U.S. Treasury market, and when you and I look at the U.S. dollar, and, and we think about the American dream that we were brought up with, we compare the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury market with perfection. Uh, other people have to take a much more pragmatic view. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to compare it with the alternatives. Now, at the Rick Rule level, having the basics of my wealth, uh, because my wealth exceeds the transactional needs that I have, having that in gold makes absolute sense. Absolute sense. We will need to develop the mechanisms on a global basis for gold as the store of wealth to be applicable to, say, Norges Bank, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, or CITIC. Uh, that's something that's going to have to develop over time. And I think that the default during the period of time that a transition occurs, if it occurs, we'll see the continued dominance of the U.S. Treasury market relative to other securities markets in the world and the continued dominance of the U.S. dollars and exchange mechanism merely because there is no default position. You know, you talked about recession insurance, uh, but with all of the hyper bubbles that are currently going on, you know, I think the markets will probably go up for a couple more months, could even go up into next year. But with the, with the hyper bubbles where they're at, I just think that th this correction is going to be horrific when it finally happens. And I want to know what assets uh, you see, because when bubbles pop, that is deflationary for a certain sector or whatever, but it could be pretty much, you know, economy wide. So what assets do you see as the best performing going into the future for both inflation and deflation? What do you see as the best strategy going forward with the potential of hyper bubbles in every area except? I call it the almost everything bubble because I don't think gold and silver are in bubbles. I, this is going to sound like a very esoteric response. Uh, I think the most important investment that somebody can make, particularly a young person, uh, is in their own education and attitudes. Uh, as risky as Congress is, the biggest risk that I face is conveniently located to the left of my right ear and to the right of my left ear. So the first thing is don't make mistakes. Uh, your own business might be recession proof if you have a durable competitive advantage over your competitors relative to your customers. I think in a less esoteric sense that people who don't store some of their uh, long-term wealth in precious metals are probably making a mistake. I continue to believe that some very large, the equities of some very large companies that have durable competitive advantages over their peers have good long-term value. It doesn't mean that their share price can't fall by 50% in a sell-off that takes down everybody. What I have built my own personal wealth on, because I understand natural resources, are uh, low-cost commodity producers who produce 
produce a commodity that is in temporary oversupply, but is necessary for the well-being uh, of humankind. When uranium was selling at $10 a pound, and it cost $35 a pound to produce it, it was pretty clear to me that the price of uranium had to go from 10 bucks to 35 bucks, or the lights would go off worldwide. When during the COVID scare, uh, and by the way, the Biden scare and the Greta scare, the oil price went briefly negative before settling out at $20 a barrel. It was very clear to me that the market clearing price of oil on a global basis, the incentive price was $60 a barrel. That meant that the oil price had to go from 20 to 60 or around the world, nobody's cars would start. So I personally believe in investing in setups, if you will, circumstances that are probabilities. In my case, I have enough education in natural resources that I have concentrated the bulk of my own net worth on low priced commodity producers that produce substances that are necessary for the material well-being of humankind, where I believe that irrespective of economic conditions, I will outperform other sectors of the economy. Make no mistake, if you have a 2008 style liquidity collapse, you will see the prices of every asset class temporarily decline. Mike, you will remember the gold price held up for 24 hours in 2008. And then it too came off like a boulder off a bridge because the sell decision isn't made by gold bugs. It's made by margin clerks and everything that has a bid gets hit. What happens though, is that the good assets come back. And the right. Assets. Yeah. The gold, gold and silver bottomed in October and the stock market didn't bottom until the following right. March. Right. So yes, there was that big sell off. Gold went from, I think, 1100 down to below eight and, uh, and the silver gold, was at 21 and fell to like seven. And the gold stock fell by half. It's important yeah. to note that. The gold stocks came back. Uh, right. But it's important to note that in a liquidity crisis, the price of everything falls like a boulder off a bridge. Now, if you have maintained sufficient liquidity, which is why I maintain US dollar liquidity, you can take advantage of that circumstance rather than being taken advantage of by that circumstance. But to do that, you have to have the knowledge so that you can segregate the value of something from its price. Yeah. You've got a, an investment symposium coming up here. I want you to tell everybody about that because they you know you've already piqued their interest on the things that that your that the majority of your wealth is personally invested but i want you to also sort of wrap you know when you when you after you've told us about the investment symposium if you had to pick just one thing to get you through the next five years what would it be oil oil uh, oil and gas oh okay the oil and gas assets are being priced by the market uh, like mr biden is right mr biden is suggesting that the oil companies need to spend more more money to bring gasoline prices now with the understanding that it's going to put them out of business in 2030. That isn't going to happen. And oil markets, oil equity markets uh, are suggesting that peak oil demand takes place in 2032. I think peak oil demand takes place in 2065. And I think that the oil business tapers off gradually for 40 years after that. So assigning a terminal value to the net present value of oil and gas assets in 2032 is just plain stupid. The oil industry, as a consequence of politics, is under investing in sustaining a new project in, uh, capital to the extent of about a billion dollars a day, $365 billion a year. Perversely, this will keep oil prices and natural gas prices higher for longer. This deferment of sustain sustaining capital impacts the industry's ability to produce. If you'd like evidence of that, look at Venezuela and Mexico. So investing in oil companies that are efficient operators uh, who, unlike their peers, are investing, reinvesting enough money in their business to maintain their production, while also using some of the surplus cash to reward shareholders by generous dividend yields and share buybacks, uh, I think are the most secure form of investments, the best juxtaposition between risk and reward that I see for the next decade. There are other investments that are more speculative, that have a positive possibility of greatly outperforming the oil business. But when I juxtapose the certainty of return in the oil business with the relative risks to reward, I don't see a better business in the world than the oil and gas business.